continuing our study and our series going through uh, the subject of end times Bible prophecy and all things that pertain unto to end times. We're just going to go from subject to subject. And, uh, and of course this is given the state of our nation and the events and everything that's going on as I've said uh, in the intro introduction of each of these sermons. Now I don't know if you've noticed this, if you've kind of been cruising around and scouring YouTube for all the new uh, theories and conspiracy theories for the videos that relate to everything that's going on. But one thing that you may have noticed is that there's been a, a massive or a vast influx of predictions of the dates of Christ's return or Christ's coming. And of course, people are going to try to take advantage of this and everybody's going to have you know, their own opinion on the day or the date in which Christ is going to come back. Now, the title of the sermon is going to make more sense to you in just a moment, but the title of the sermon is, Will the Rapture Happen in 2020? Will the Rapture Happen in 2020? There's going to be a couple of things that I answer from that question and kind of branch out from there. But if we were to do such a thing, if we were to try to set a date, if we were to try to find out exactly when Jesus Christ was coming back, where do you think we would go? We'd go to the Bible if we were going to do such a thing, right? So if we were to try to set a date, and there's all these people out there that, you know, they have the exact day. They know the exact hour. They know the exact date. They can tell you the year, the month, the day, the time, everything. Down to the, the minute, the second. I've heard so many different people try to predict all of this, and I'm sure you have as well. A lot of times they don't even use this, the Bible. They don't even go to the Bible to try to give their prediction. So if we were to do such a thing, where would we go? We would go to the Bible. So let's, let's do that right now. Let's look at verse number 36. Matthew chapter number 24. I want you to look with me on this topic of answering the question, will the rapture happen in 2020? And can I tell you that? Look at what the Bible says in verse number 36. It says this, <coughs> But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now I believe everybody in here had enough sense to know that I wasn't going to give you a day or a, or a date or an hour or something ridiculous like that because the Bible plainly tells us that no man knows the day or the hour. No man can tell you the date and if any person ever tries to tell you the hour or the day, if he tries to put some sort of time limit on precisely when Jesus Christ is going to come back He's a liar, he's a false prophet, and he's a charlatan. And the reason why these people do this is to make money. Because these types of, you know, these types of predictions and things like that, it gets people on the edge of their seat and they're just going to keep coming back for more repeatedly. What people don't want to hear is what I just said a moment ago. They don't want to hear that you can't know. People like the, the, the mystery. They like you know, this mystery and they like it to be solved and they like it to, the, 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 you know, the code to be cracked. And that's why people you know, will flock to those types of preachers when they can give them the answer to these mysteries. Well, right here we have the, the, the plain answer to the question, you know, will the rapture happen in 2020? And I'm going to get into another way in which we can find that out. But the Bible tells us in the first place that we can't know the day or the hour. So that needs to be our starting point here. We can, no man knows the day or the hour. He said, and he says this, No, not the angels of heaven. He says, but my Father only. So even the Lord Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, when he was walking on this earth, he says that he did not even know the day or the hour. Now, if we dive down further into the context, we can prove that this is actually telling us that we cannot know. I've heard people say, well, yeah, but later in the future, they found out. Because they'll try to say, well, you know, Jesus Christ in heaven, are you trying to say that he doesn't know? Well, of course, Jesus Christ, now that he's went to heaven, he knows. You know, the everlasting Father, when he goes to heaven, and obviously while he was on this earth, he was subject to the same limitations that we're subject to. But once he went to heaven, we stayed limited on this earth and he is no longer. He went to heaven, he was glorified, he has you know, all knowledge, all wisdom. In that sense, he no longer has the restrictions and the limitations of the flesh. Of course Jesus Christ knows. But I'm going to show you from the context that, that it actually teaches you that you're not going to know and no one is going to know or be aware the exact day when it happens. That's actually what's being taught in Matthew chapter number 24. Look at verse number 37. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Let's see in what way. For as in the days, 
For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. What's that describing? Regular everyday life. Right? That's the point. Until the day that Noe entered into the ark. Now the point there, and it's very important, is to notice that it says until the day. His whole point is that they didn't even know that exact day. No one was aware of the exact day of when that was going to take place. They did it all the way up until that exact day. No one, was, no one knew. That's the point. Keep looking at what it says next. <coughs> it says, uh, 39 once more, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Excuse me. Then shall, then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, the one shall be taken and the other left. And then he says this in verse 42. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. And then he goes on after this, and it's outside of the spectrum of the sermon, but he goes on after this to use a parable of a man that is going to be rewarded because he's doing what he's supposed to do, but he wasn't exactly sure when his master was going to be coming back. This man was not aware of when his master was coming back, and he's a servant, and he stays faithful, and when his master returns, he was still being faithful, even though he was not aware of when his master was coming back. So what he's teaching is this, man, you know, the, the saved, born-again believers, we're not going to be aware of the day and the hour that the Lord Jesus Christ exactly is going to be coming back. We're not going to know that. We're not going to know the day or the hour. And if we are still watching and if we are still faithful, the Bible teaches that there is a special reward and that He will reward those people that are watching and that are faithful with a special reward that they wouldn't have otherwise received. So that's very important to make sure that we are ready and we are waiting. But furthermore, this proves even further that we are not going to know the day or the hour. Now, the other reason why we know that the rapture is not going to occur in 2020 is because there are other things that must take place first. So what this sermon is actually going to be dedicated to is debunking the pre-tribulation rapture. Now, this is going to be a very simple sermon, I believe, because it's a very simple topic. It's very easy to debunk. There are some things in the Bible that are obtuse and, and they can be somewhat, you know, uh, uh, ambiguous and confusing, but the subject of the timing of the rapture is very clear, and it's very easy to prove backwards, forwards, comparing so many different scriptures, revelation we can pull into it. It's just so easy to prove. Now, I preached a sermon, and we'll go to Matthew 24, verse 1, if you don't mind. I preached a sermon a couple of weeks ago entitled, The Signs of the End of the World. Another title of that sermon could have been, The Signs of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Because there's actually a two-part question that's asked. Look at Matthew 24 verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Look at verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, <coughs> you can really say it's a three-part question. But I'm going to focus on the last two parts of the question. There's two questions really there wrapped into one. And it says this, And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Now, those two things are asked and kind of ran together because it's the same exact event. It's talking about the exact same event. That's why when Jesus Christ responds and he answers and he goes through and articulates all of these different signs, he doesn't di differentiate, well, these are the signs of the end of the world and these are the signs of my coming. He doesn't separate the two because of the same signs. So if you'd like, you could go back and you could re-listen to the sermon that I preached on the signs of the end of the world. And everything that I preached applies to the signs of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. Everything. So you're wondering, hey, what, what has to happen before the Lord Jesus Christ comes back? Everything that's listed in Matthew chapter number 24 that he goes over. It's that simple. And I don't want to re-preach that exact same topic, but that is what has to take place beforehand. Now, I am going to focus on one specific thing, and I just mentioned this a moment ago. I'm going to be debunking what is, the, is held by 99% of people 
it's, it's specific. What, what you know, bothers me is that it's held by all Baptists, all saved believers, all true born-again Bible believers hold this doctrine. And it is the doctrine of the pre-tribulation rapture. What that means is that they believe that the rapture is going to take place before the tribulation. The Bible is crystal clear. It is very, very clear. We're going to delve into this right here early on and just debunk it in the first two to three minutes. The Bible is very clear that the rapture does not occur pre-tribulation, but it actually occurs post-tribulation. What that means is after the tribulation. Now here in Matthew chapter number 24, he starts to give the signs, all the signs that we went over. The very end there, he, he concises, or he uh, 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 you know, summarizes in verse number 7 <clears throat> with the beginning. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So everything he spoke about before that were the beginning of sorrows. He then afterwards goes into the what we would refer to as the great tribulation. And that is the persecution of the saints. Let's pick up in verse number 9. It says this. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall, shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now watch this, verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. So I want you to notice that right there, before we get to, we haven't got to the end of the world, we haven't got to, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ's return, it specifically refers to this time period as great tribulation. Now it's called great tribulation because the time period just prior to this was referred to as the beginning of sorrows. Now the beginning of sorrows would be more of like small tribulation, like great and small are the two words that the Bible uses when it's escalating or contrasting, right? So it would have been small tribulation when we were referring to the beginning of sorrows. But right here, when we see the abomination of desolation, we see the persecution vamped up coming from the Antichrist, the Bible says that at that time, it says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no, nor ever shall be. That's strong language. It's saying there, was, there has never been tribulation like this ever on the, on the planet or on the earth. This is going to be a, a tougher time, a harder time. It's going to be worse persecution than has ever existed. So this is talking about the tribulation of the end times. There's no doubt about that. Then it says in verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall, dece they shall deceive the very elect. <clears throat> Verse 25, he repeats it. Behold, I have told you before. <clears throat> Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. I want you to notice how, as I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago in one of the sermons on end times, that the Antichrist will be believable. I want you to notice how he is emphasizing, he is stressing, don't believe it. Don't believe it. He actually three different times repeats himself. If you look back at verse number, uh, uh, it is verse number five. 
in chapter number 24. That's where he mentions first the, the false Christ arising. He mentions it also in verse number 11, the false prophets and the false Christ. Then he mentions it in verse number 24. But then he says in verse number 25, Behold, I have told you before. Right? So he's repeating himself again. And he says, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. So notice that there are a lot of warnings about this because he will be believable in a big way. He'll, he'll deceive people at least into getting him, them to come out and come to look. And There's one point though that is very, very strong that Jesus is trying to make that we're going to find out in the very next verse. Because notice he says there in verse number 26, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. Now watch verse 27. For... That means because. So don't believe them. And then watch this. Because, or for, as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall be, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So I want you to notice what he just explained. So he's saying, hey, if you just hear about some guy that's saying that he's the Antichrist. If there's maybe a rumor that some guy went into a temple somewhere, not the Antichrist, he's not going to say, hey, I'm the Antichrist, saying he's the Christ, you, there's a rumor of some guy, or you see something on the news of some man that's declaring himself to be the Savior, he's declaring himself to be God, or maybe it's just word of mouth. Maybe you, you see it on your Facebook news feed, right? He's saying, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Why? And then he explains it. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west. Now is that something that you could overlook? Not even close, huh? Now is that, is that something that's kind of subtle or is that something that's pretty attention grabbing? Right? It's right out in front of you. That's the point. So that's kind of subtle, right? The, the, the first thing. Some guy just said he's, you know, the Christ. Right? Some guy just claimed to be the Christ. That's pretty subtle. That's, he's saying, that's not the way that I'm going to return when I come back. That's his point. When, you see me here now with you, but when I come back, it's not going to be like that. That's his point. It's going to be a dramatic entrance. That's very important. It's going to be a dramatic, powerful, attention-grabbing, everyone is going to see him. Look at verse 27 again. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth unto the west, even so, or I'm sorry, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now look at verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear. Notice that, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I want you to notice that it said that all the tribes of the earth are going to mourn, and then it says, speaking about the tribes of the earth, and they shall see. That's everyone. We're also told this in Revelation chapter number 1 that every eye shall see him. So this is not something where you're just going to hear about, you know, this guy who, you know, claimed that he was God and, oh, Jesus Christ is back and now he's all of a sudden back in the temple. That's his point is that's not how I'm going to return. When I return, I'm going to return in my glory. I'm going to return as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and he's going to make it known. That's what 1 Timothy chapter 6 is about. People want to try to make that about you know, just God the Father and not the Lord Jesus Christ. No, it's talking about that when he comes back in Revelation, when he comes back, every eye is going to see him and it's going to be obvious that this is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And if, it, if it's not obvious by the power and the glory that emits from him, you'll see it written on his thigh. I think that will make it pretty obvious that it's written on the, you know, his thigh on his garment that he is the Lord of Lords and king of kings. Now verse 29, it should be a closed argument. We should be done discussing this of the timing of the rapture because it says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days. Now what question did the disciples ask him? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? He goes through all of these signs, right? The signs of the end of the world. But they're also the signs of his coming. And then after he describes all of this, he talks about the tribulation, the beginning of sorrows, and the great tribulation. And then he says this, immediately after 
the tribulation of those days. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. And then and he describes some other things, and then skip down to verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. What, when does the Bible teach that the rapture takes place? Pre or post-tribulation? Post-tribulation. It's as clear as day. There's no argument. I have, I have you know, so many family members. They're pre-tribulation. I know so many you know, good Baptists in many ways, right? But they're screwed up on this doctrine. But it's so clear. The rapture takes place after the tribulation. Because this is when the Lord Jesus Christ come back, comes back. And then it describes the rapture in verse number 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So notice that the Lord Jesus Christ is in the sky. And he sends his angels and the, there's a trumpet that's blown. And they go and they gather us up. Saying up into the air. And that's where we get the word rapture from. It's a Latin word that actually means the catching up or the catching away. Saying we are gathered up. It's talking about the direction that we are going in. And there are many people even today that try to... Uh, they go so far as to say that there is not even a teaching of the rapture in the Bible. Which is a ridiculous teaching. Right? So I'm not even going to spend time on that. But the Bible teaches that the rapture is real. The Bible teaches that the Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. And it couldn't be any clearer that the Lord Jesus Christ's return takes place after the tribulation. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter number 6. I want you to remember, as I said, this is going to be a, a, a simpler sermon. Everybody is, I believe, familiar with this subject, but there's no way that I could preach on end times, uh, an end times series and not touch on the subject of the rapture and the timing of the rapture specifically. Now, when we went through Matthew chapter number 24 in the signs of the end of the world, what we did was we went back and forth from Revelation 6 to Matthew 24 and we compared the signs and we're given different details. But you know what we found was we saw the same sequence of events taking place that occur in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. It's just two different accounts of the same events taking place one after the next, right? One event after the next. Now, where we stopped in, in that sermon of the signs of the end of the world the world was with the last sign. We stopped with the very last sign, <coughs> excuse me, which was the fifth seal, right? It was the fifth seal and it was the tribulation or the persecution of the saints. And there are a, quite a few different signs that take place with that. It's initiated by, you know, the abomination of desolation. And there are a few other things that we pointed out, but we stopped roughly or generally with the fifth seal. Now, if we compare that sequence of events, sequence of events, there's something that happens right after those signs in both passages. In Matthew chapter number 24 and Revelation 6, which strengthens this teaching and which further bolsters and proves that the rapture is post-tribulation. I want you to look with me at Revelation chapter number 6. We just read Matthew 24, so we don't need to compare the two. But if you look with me at verse number 9, we'll see the fifth seal, which was the great tribulation that we read about, the persecution. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet <coughs> for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. So now we have the sixth seal opening. This is going just past the signs of the end of the world. We're moving forward now. And I beheld <coughs> when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo... There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. 
And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bond man and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand let me ask you this question do we read about this taking place in Matthew 24 the signs of the end of the world we did read about this. We, re we, we, we stopped right there when it talks about the signs of the end of the world. I purposely stopped right there with the fifth seal. I stopped purposely at the tribulation or what is also otherwise referred to as persecution. Now if you look up the word tribulation, it's very obvious that what it means is persecution. I'll give you one example. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 4 says, So that we ourselves glory, glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. We also see this when we see the parable of the sower. It, he talks about with one of the seeds that are sown, when it starts to grow up, it says when persecution or tribulation ariseth by and by because of the word he is offended. So those persecution and tribulation, these are the same things. So when it's talking about tribulation, it's talking about the persecution of the saints. And we can see that even from just reading the text. What's going on in the tribulation? Uh, there are martyrs, right? It's, there's much talk of martyrdom, of people being killed for the cause of Christ. That is what occurs during the period of the Great Tribulation. Well, in Matthew chapter number 24, when we go through those signs, it ends with the Great Tribulation. That's where we ended. But then it goes further and it tells you in verse number 29 that we read about. It says this, immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is the next event, shall the sun be darkened, notice that, and the moon shall not give her light. And it says, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. We are given four very, very specific details of signs of the end of the world. Now, I purposely left that out because I wanted to use this in the sermon where I discussed the timing of the rapture. These are also signs of the end of the world, but they are more so uh, related to, I believe, and they're perfectly used when we discuss the signs of the Lord Jesus Christ coming. If we go back to Revelation chapter number 6, I want you to notice that we see all four of those specific signs and they all take place right in that same order. It says this, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. We saw the sun being darkened, and the moon became as blood. Notice that the moon's not giving its light, is it? And now it's, it's become blood. And blood is a, is a very dark color, actually. It's not like a vibrant red. It's a, it's a very dark red. It says, And the moon became as blood. And it says, And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. That also was spoken of in Matthew 24. And then it says this, Even as a fig tree cast with her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's referring to a great earthquake. Now, the exact same signs were actually recorded in Matthew 24. In the exact same order. Now, what took place immediately after these signs? What was the very next thing that we saw in Matthew 24? Exactly. We saw the Son of Man. We saw the Lord Jesus Christ coming. So if this is the same event, which I, I believe it's already obvious enough that it is, with all these specific signs that are all in the same order, all the seals lining up perfectly with the, the sequence of events that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, prophesied would take place, then we see all of the same events taking place on the day. Now these are the signs of the exact day of when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. That's what's important. These are actually all the signs that take place you could even say at the very moment when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. There are the signs of the day. Now, it's, it's too late. 
Now the Lord Jesus Christ is here. It's basically his rolling out of the red carpet of when he's showing up. I mean, he's there, the, the, the limo is pulled up, and it's a dramatic you know, entrance is basically what is going on. All of those things take place here, and we see that. So what should we expect to find here in the book of Revelation in chapter number 6 or thereabouts? We should, exactly, we should, that was a little too, too specific, Brother Hall, but we should expect to see the Lord Jesus Christ or what happened with the Lord Jesus Christ was they were gathered together. We should expect to see the rapture taking place. And notice how they were gathered together in Matthew 24. Well, at the very end here, it discusses in Revelation 6, it discusses the wrath beginning. This is God's wrath being initiated. But if we skip down to chapter number 7, you know, it speaks first about in chapter number 7 about these men that are being sealed, the 144,000, which are not directly related to what we're talking about right now. But it also says this. I want you to look at verse number 9 in chapter number 7. <coughs> it says this. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now let me ask you a question. Where was the Lamb and where was the throne located in the previous chapters? It was located in heaven because John went up to heaven, didn't he, when he was given this vision. So where are all these people located now? All these people, this great multitude, that obviously, the point is that these people were not there just a moment ago. None of these people were here. He says, and lo, he's saying, behold, he's saying he looked, and then he saw something that he hadn't previously seen. He looks, and then it says, a great multitude which no man could number. No man is able to count or number this people. It's so many people. Do you know why? Because this is the rapture taking place. And what happens at the rapture is every believer, every single believer, all of those that are alive at that moment, they are caught up in the sky in their body and their body is transformed, it says in 1 Corinthians 15. But not only that, if we look in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, every Christian that has lived previously, that has died like those martyrs that were in heaven before the altar and before the throne and crying unto the Lord, every single one of them, they're going to come back with the Lord Jesus Christ and then their body is going to you know, erupt or blow out of the earth and it's going to meet their soul in the air. So every single person is going to be standing there that has ever lived in their body in heaven standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. Every person that has ever lived. And that's what we see taking place. Now doesn't that make perfect sense that in Matthew 24 we see all of these signs taking place. All of the same signs as the seals that are open. All of them. Every single one of them happened. Then we see events that take place on the exact day of Jesus Christ's coming. And in Matthew 24, it tells us that at His coming, that is when the rapture takes place, right? That's when He's going to gather us together. That's when He's going to gather up you know, from the four winds all of the elect. Those are the saved, right? The chosen. And then in Revelation 6, all the same events. All of them take place on the exact same day, very specific events. And then all of a sudden, and lo, a great multitude appears in heaven. That's because we read about, with the first five seals, we read about the tribulation taking place in Revelation chapter number 6. And you know what you read about in chapter number, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, in chapter number 6, which is the seal, the sixth seal being opened? That is the initiation of the Lord Jesus Christ coming back, the end of the world, and that is the moment when the rapture takes place. And it's very clear, even from the book of Revelation itself, which is the end times book, that the rapture takes place post-tribulation. I mean, it's as clear as day. There are no scriptures that even begin to support, you know, pre-tribulation rapture. Uh, they have to grasp at straws. They try to take a verse out of Matthew 24 for crying out loud. Uh, you know, uh, I want you to turn though, I'm not even going to get on those subjects before I go too far. Go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. I don't want to go to the verse in Matthew 24 just because it, it truly is a waste of time. But we'll go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 because there are two things where I understand that, that, that people could have, they could be somewhat confused um, if they hadn't otherwise studied uh, the subject. 
But that is where people are confused about the difference between the tribulation and God's wrath. Now, I already defined for you the tribulation is persecution. It's the persecution of the saints. It is when the fifth seal is opened and we see people dying, right? We see great tribulation occurring and persecution of the saints. Then we have God's wrath that takes place. Now, if you remember in Matthew chapter number 24, it tells you immediately after the tribulation of those days. So it actually tells you that everything that takes place, you know, after the tribulation of those days, I'm sorry, uh, 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 everything that takes place after the tribulation, which would be, you have the sun and moon being darkened, right? You have the, the, the stars falling from the sky. These are the signs of the day of Jesus Christ coming. So this happens after the tribulation. That was confusing the way I worded that for a minute. But that happens after the tribulation. So therefore, everything that happened before that was what? Tribulation, right? That's tribulation. We see the Lord Jesus Christ coming back, all of those signs. And then we see at the end of Revelation chapter number 6, we see all the people crying in the, the, to the rocks and the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the face of, uh, of, of him that sitteth on the throne, he says, and from the wrath of the Lamb. And then they say this, For the great day of his wrath is come, present tense, and who shall be able to stand? So what people will oftentimes do that are pre-tribulation, and this is one of their reasons why they're so confused, is they will inflate the two. When they say tribulation, they're talking about God's wrath. When actually God's wrath begins the day where the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. That is when His wrath begins. It's actually after He gathers us up and then He seals the 144,000 and then He begins to pour out His wrath on the earth. So there's actually a clear division between the tribulation, which is everything that takes place before the sun and moon being darkened, before the stars falling from the sky and all of that dramatic entrance of the Lord Jesus Christ, and then after that is God's wrath. And the very clear division is this. Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ's return or His coming, that is what separates tribulation from God's wrath. And it, the easy way to remember this is this. What's the purpose why He comes at the moment that He does? It's to give us salvation, right? Physical salvation. It's to come back and to save us from the persecution that we're enduring. Now, what does He begin to do to those that are on the earth because of our persecution and tribulation? He begins to punish them and to pour out His wrath. So, wouldn't it make perfect sense that He would, he would save us from the earth? He would take us from the earth prior to pouring out His wrath? Of course. So that's what we have there. We have this clear division between the tribulation and God's wrath. Now I want you to look at one of the verses that people will turn to, those that are pre-tribulation. And in it's 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, verse number 9, it says this, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. And what they'll say is they'll say, See, God has not appointed us to wrath, so the, the, the tribulation, or I'm sorry, the rapture has to be pre-tribulation. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all if you actually understand that the tribulation is distinct from and a separate event than God's wrath. Because I read this verse and I say, Amen. God has not appointed us to wrath. That's why God raptures us out when He comes back. And that's why right then they say, now His wrath is coming. Now He's going to start destroying them. That makes perfect sense with my position. I have no issues. I have no problems with that. It's because it's actually what the Bible teaches. Now, I want you to go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. And I want to show you that this is actually consistent even within the book of 1 Thessalonians. And uh, they would have a problem just, uh, explaining this verse. Because look at verse number 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. Now what is an affliction? Affliction is like a persecution or a tribulation, right? He says that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now keep reading in verse 4. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer Tribulation. Did you notice what he just used interchangeable? He used the word tribulation 
and affliction interchangeable. He said in verse number 3 that no man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know, watch this, that we are appointed thereunto. So notice that he's saying we're appointed to, to uh, afflictions. But then what did he call those very afflictions in verse number 4? He said, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation. So what's another way to word that? That we are appointed unto what? Tribulation. I want you to notice that. So here in verse number 3 and 4 of chapter 3, in the same book of 1 Thessalonians, it actually teaches, the Holy Ghost actually teaches that we as Christians are appointed to suffer tribulation. We have, appo we have been appointed unto tribulation. Hey, I'll uh, go ahead and turn to John chapter number 16. I agree with you that we as Christians are not appointed unto God's wrath. But you know what the Bible does teach that we are appointed unto? Tribulation. We are appointed unto tribulation from the very book it teaches the exact same thing. So it's this misunderstanding of what the word actually means when it talks about tribulation. Now here in John chapter number 16, uh, we're going to end here actually, and this is why this subject, <clears throat> excuse me, this is why this subject is so important. It's because many people are not prepared for tribulation. Many people, they, you know, they've got it in their mind that, hey, I'm not going to have to go through tribulation. Jesus Christ is going to come back any minute before, before, you know, before the heat is turned up. Before any problems begin, before there's any trouble, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back and, and He's going to save me out of it. Well, hey, the Lord Jesus, if you're saved, He's not going to pour His wrath out upon you. He's not going to pour His wrath out upon you, but let me promise you that you are appointed under tribulation and that you as a Christian, the Bible teaches that you will be here during the persecution. You will be here during the tribulation. You will be here during the time of afflictions, the beginning of sorrows, and the Lord Jesus Christ will come and He will save us out of those problems and out of those trials. But you will be here during that time. And the whole reason why the pre-tribulation rapture has, has ever even caught traction in the first place is because it is a, it's a pleasant doctrine to believe. It's nice, it's comforting to believe the, the teaching that, hey, I'm never going to face any problems. But you know what? It's not biblical even in your own personal lives. The Bible teaches that to everyone that lives godly, that they shall suffer persecution. Right. Anyone who lives a godly life, you will suffer persecution. So even in your life alone, that's not even biblical. But let alone speaking about the subject of end times. And we need to be aware of this and people need to know that they are going to be facing this possibly in their lifetimes. So we need to wake people up to this truth. We need to wake people up to the clear truth that the tribulation, the tribulation will occur with Christians on this earth. And then the rapture will take place. I want you to look with me at John chapter number 16. And we'll begin reading in verse number 29. His disciples said unto him, Lo, now speakest thou plainly, and speakest no proverb. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things, and needest not that any man should ask thee. <clears throat> By this we believe that thou camest forth from God. Jesus answered them, do ye, no, do ye now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Now I want you to notice, I don't know, I don't know if you've ever picked this up before, but notice how Jesus says, behold, he says this first. Jesus answered them, do ye now believe? What's the implication? That they believe now, that they have strong faith then, but what's he implying? That maybe they didn't before, or maybe what? They may not after. And you know what he references specifically is a time of persecution and tribulation that occurs immediately thereafter. He references the time when what Peter does, where he denies the Lord. Now what happens with Peter? His faith wavers. Yes, he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, but do you know what? He didn't endure in his faith, did he? When it came to, you know, the persecution that he endured and having to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's what he's implying. He says, Jesus answered them, Do ye now believe? And then he says this, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered. That sound familiar? Kind of sounds like what happens in the tribulation, doesn't it? Every man to his own and shall leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. And he says in verse 33, 
These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So I want you to notice there that he gives this warning to them. He tells them, hey, I've told you about these things because it's going to happen. You're going to have tribulation. So notice it's important that he warned them and that he let them know that tribulation is coming. And notice how he says, in the world, he doesn't say you might. He says, in the world, you shall have tribulation. If any Christian thinks that they are just going to, if that they're going to be alive during the end times, but that Jesus is coming back just to save them before the tribulation begins, they're dreaming. They're dreaming. You know what Jesus said? You shall have tribulation. Christian, you will be here for the tribulation. Whether you like that idea or not, we have to just believe the Bible, and the Bible plainly teaches after the tribulation of they, those days, that's when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. So you know what we need to do? We need to face the facts. You shall have tribulation. We need to strengthen ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves. You know what else we need to do? Just as Jesus said here, we can find peace in Jesus and in His words. These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. And then He says, in the world you shall have tribulation. And this, these, this is even the better part. But be of good cheer. Why? I have overcome peace the world. No matter what happens. Hey, it may not be a pleasant subject. I understand that, that a lot of people might fight with believing what the Bible teaches on this subject because it's kind of hard to, to, to really accept the idea of what's going to take place in the end times. It's going to be the worst time of trouble and persecution and tribulation that has ever occurred. And I understand that's not a pleasant subject. I get that. I understand that that can be difficult. But do you know what makes it all better? The fact that Jesus overcome, overcame for us. Amen. The fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, He did all the work for us, and that He overcame the world. And if we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, He'll be coming back to save us out of that Amen. tribulation. And you can receive greater rewards and, and, and uh, all of these other great things if you are able to endure through the tribulation. So, you know what's important? We just need to believe the Bible. Even if it's hard sometimes, even if it's... It's a big pill to swallow. You need to believe the Word of God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you, dear Lord God, for the words of peace, the words of comfort, that you love us, that you want us to find peace in you, everything that you did for us so that we can have peace, we can have comfort, uh, and so that we can overcome through you. We love you so much and just give us the power of the Spirit in our lives that we can grow, that we can learn more about you, we can become a better Christian each day, dear God, and be prepared, uh, even if this doesn't occur in our lifetime, that we can just grow as a Christian. Uh, we love you so much and just be with our church, help our church to grow, and help us all to grow as individuals. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen.